Hi, again. It is still August 9, 2021. I'm going to play a few minutes of this video. Um, I can't listen to the lies. I really feel like it's just tearing away at me, these this incredible saturation of lies that we are now living in. That, that, that's it, you know. And I'm not talking about just collectively, please. I'm talking about this society that we have all manifested. It's a society of sickness. It is a society of mass psychosis. After playing a few minutes of this, I'm, I'm going to play a few minutes of several videos that I will link to below and I hope that you listen to them and you circulate them and yeah we are digging deeper into a very dark totalitarian system all of our governments have turned into uh, just these totalitarian regimes and unless we change ourselves, nothing will change. So this right here, Mr. CIA, has uh, posted this segment a couple of days ago and I learned about it from Erin Elizabeth. Uh, you know, they're going after people now. They are going after people. And if this doesn't wake anybody up, well, how many times have we said that throughout the years? If this doesn't wake people up, if, well, if this doesn't wake people up, if this, it doesn't seem to be happening. Why? Because it's the individuals receiving this information who have mental illness and they are not doing anything to get well. Oh, they seem well. They appear well. They pay their bills or they... <laughs> today, I don't even know if that is happening. But you see them out in your community. They walk about. Yeah, a lot of them wear masks. Some of them are awake, just walking about. And they're so... delusional you know the, the self-centeredness in our country is really extreme and as long as I just stick to my own life and you know don't really look up and notice anything I won't have to change I won't have to do anything beyond what I'm doing. It's sad that life has just become this habit that people live until they die. So listen to this. As we mentioned in our conversation with Bill Gates, the Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that more than half of the unvaccinated Americans think the vaccine is more dangerous than COVID. The Biden administration has come down hard on vaccine misinformation, but one Florida doctor has seemingly gone to great lengths to perpetuate it. 360's Randy Kay now with a story, the hunt to find him and the reasons behind his actions. It's an unproven vaccine. It's just being accelerated and eliminated virtually every safety study. He is the ultimate super spreader, not of the coronavirus experts say, but of misinformation about COVID-19. His name is Dr. Joseph Mercola. It is very likely that most people in America, if not you know, the vast majority of people in America have seen misinformation that has originated with this super spreader of lies and misinformation. That's exactly why the Center for Countering Digital Hate, a nonprofit tracking misinformation about COVID online, put Dr. Mercola, an osteopathic physician, at the top of its disinformation dozen. The disinformation dozen, Sherry Tenpenny. Ah, uh, Erin Elizabeth, Joseph McCullough, number one, Christian Northrup, 
Okay. And Robert F. Kennedy. People can really destroy people's reputation with and just go about their business, go home, sleep well, get up, do the same thing the next day. But this is, this is Nazi Germany. This is the propaganda. They start coming after people and we didn't learn. We didn't learn. And it's here. Mainstream media. Yeah, I'm not sure who, what video I was watching or it wasn't an article, but they said that the main enemies, big pharma, big tech, big media. And you don't even have to, you know, study, study for hours or years what took place in Germany, what took place in all totalitarian regimes to know that something is very wrong here. Going after the Republicans, the Trump supporters, the, the new war against domestic extremists. And Americans are just going about their business like they live still in the same country, and they don't. They don't. It has absolutely been taken over. We are living that new world order. How did the, all of this manifest? Well, let's see. I am going to play, play just a few minutes of this video after school. And I will link below to After School's channel. Brilliant. <laughs> he takes <coughs> other people's videos and then he sketches out uh, the narration. But what does he say here? We cannot change the world but we can change ourselves. And that will change the world. Well, it's up to every individual to change themselves. You know, and of course, we need that change very fast in the aggregate happening yesterday. So, People don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the work. So we have been driven into a world, which I've been saying for years and years, we live in a psychiatric institution, driven into a world of mass psychosis. So after school, don't please don't give me a copyright strike. I am saying that these illustrations that you're doing, brilliant. I am passing along your channel in the hopes that you will come over here. Subscribe. Because he has a lot of very good, you know, videos that he has chosen chosen. And well, I'll let you decide for yourself, um, you know, his talent on illustration. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste preferring to deify error if error seduce them. Whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. Whoever attempts to destroy their illusions is always their victim. According to the psychologist Carl Jung, the greatest threat to civilization lies not with the forces of nature, nor with any physical disease, but with our inability to deal with the forces of our own psyche. We are our own worst enemies, or as the Latin proverb puts it, 
man is a wolf to man. In Civilization in Transition, Jung states that this proverb is a sad yet eternal truism, and our wolf-like tendencies come most prominently into play at those times of history when mental illness becomes the norm rather than the exception in a society, a situation which Jung termed a psychic epidemic. Indeed, it is becoming ever more obvious, he writes, that it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself, who is man's greatest danger to man, for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic epidemics, which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural catastrophes. In this video we are going to explore the most dangerous of all psychic epidemics, the mass psychosis. A mass psychosis is an epidemic of madness, and it occurs when a large portion of a society loses touch with reality and descends into delusions. Such a phenomenon is not a thing of fiction. Two examples of mass psychoses are the American and European witch hunts of the 16th and 17th centuries, and the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century. During the witch hunts, thousands of individuals, mostly women, were killed, not for any crimes they committed, but because they became the scapegoats of societies gone mad. In some Swiss villages, writes Francis Hill, there were scarcely any women left alive after the frenzy had finally burned itself out. When a mass psychosis occurs, the results are devastating. Jung studied this phenomenon and wrote that the individuals who make up the infected society become morally and spiritually inferior. They sink unconsciously to an inferior intellectual level. They become more unreasonable, irresponsible, emotional, erratic, and unreliable, and worst of all, crimes the individual alone could never stand are freely committed by the group smitten by madness. What makes matters worse is that those suffering from a mass psychosis are unaware of what is occurring. For just as an individual gone mad cannot step out of his mind to observe the errors in his ways, so too there is no Archimedean point from which those living through a mass psychosis can observe their collective madness. But what causes a mass psychosis? To answer this question we must first explore what drives an individual mad. While there are many potential triggers of madness, such as an excessive use of drugs or alcohol, brain injuries and other illnesses, these physical causes will not concern us here. Our concern is with psychological, or what are called psychogenic triggers, as these are the most common culprits of the mass psychosis. The most prevalent psychogenic cause of a psychosis is a flood of negative emotions, such as fear or anxiety, that drives an individual into a state of panic. When in a state of panic, an individual will naturally seek relief, as it is too mentally and physically draining to subsist in this hyper-emotional state. While escaping from the state of panic can be accomplished through adaptive means, such as facing up to and defeating the fear-generating threat, another way to escape is to undergo a psychotic break. A psychotic break is not a descent into a state of greater disorder, as many believe, but a reordering of one's experiential world, which blends fact and fiction, or delusions and reality, in a way that helps end the feelings of panic. Silvano Arietti, one of the 20th century's foremost authorities on schizophrenia, explains the psychogenic steps that lead to madness. Firstly, there is the phase of panic, when the patient starts to perceive things in a different way, is frightened on account of it, appears confused, and does not know how to explain the strange things that are happening. The next step is what Arietti calls a phase of psychotic insight whereby an individual succeeds in putting things together by devising a pathological way of seeing reality which allows him to explain his abnormal experiences. The phenomenon is called insight because the patient finally sees meaning and relations in his experiences. But the insight is psychotic because it is based on delusions, not on adaptive and life-promoting ways of relating to whatever threats precipitated the panic. The delusions, in other words, allow the panic-stricken individual to escape from the flood of negative emotions, but at the cost of losing touch with reality, and for this reason, Arietti says that a psychotic break can be viewed as an abnormal way of dealing with an extreme state of anxiety. 
If a panic triggering flood of negative emotions in a weak and vulnerable individual can trigger a psychotic break, then a mass psychosis can result when a population of weak and vulnerable individuals is driven into a state of panic by threats real, imagined, or fabricated. But as delusions can take many forms, and as madness can manifest in countless ways, the specific manner in which a mass psychosis unfolds will differ based on the historical and cultural context of the infected society. But in the modern era, it is the mass psychosis of totalitarianism that appears to be the greatest threat. Totalitarianism, writes Arthur Verslewis, is the modern phenomenon of total centralized state power, coupled with the obliteration of individual human rights. In the totalized state, there are those in power, and there are the objectified masses, the victims. In a totalitarian society, the population is divided into two groups, the rulers and the ruled, and both groups undergo a pathological transformation. The rulers are elevated to an almost godlike status, which is diametrically opposed to our nature as imperfect beings who are easily corrupted by power. The masses, on the other hand, are transformed into the dependent subjects of these pathological rulers and take on a psychologically regressed and childlike status. Hannah Arendt, one of the 20th century's preeminent scholars of this form of rule, called totalitarianism an attempted transformation of human nature itself. But this attempted transformation only turns sound minds into sick minds. For as the Dutch medical doctor who studied the mental effects of living under totalitarianism wrote, There is in fact much that is comparable between the strange reactions of the citizens of totalitarianism and their culture as a whole, on the one hand, and the reactions of the sick schizophrenic on the other. The social transformation that unfolds under totalitarianism is built upon and sustained by delusions. For only deluded men and women regress to the childlike status of obedient and submissive subjects and hand over complete control of their lives to politicians and bureaucrats. Only a deluded ruling class will believe that they possess the knowledge, wisdom, and acumen to completely control society in a top-down manner. And only when under the spell of delusions would anyone believe that a society composed of power-hungry rulers on the one hand and a psychologically regressed population, on the other, will lead to anything other than mass suffering and social ruin. And that's where we are now. Okay, I will link below. I, for some of you, you may not have recognized the voice, the narration. The narration was Academy of Ideas. And... Academy of Ideas just posted this video a couple of days ago. Is 1984 becoming a reality? George Orwell's warning to the world. <laughs> In 1940, George Orwell wrote, Almost certainly we are moving into an age of totalitarian dictatorships, an age in which freedom of thought will be at first a deadly sin and later on a meaningless abstraction. The autonomous individual is going to be stamped out of existence. George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984 is a work of fiction, but much that is depicted in it reflects the political realities of many nations, past and present. At least three quarters of what Orwell narrates is not negative utopia, but history, Umberto Eco wrote. Referring to his time spent in Belgrade under communist rule, Lawrence Durrell wrote that, Reading 1984 in a communist country is really an experience, because one can see it all around one. In this video, we are going to explore some of the similarities between the totalitarian systems of the 20th century and Orwell's 1984. And as will become evident, many of these totalitarian traits are re-emerging in the modern world. This investigation will be conducted in the recognition that totalitarianism relies on mass support. And so, contemporary societies desperately need more people to withdraw their support of this brutal form of rule. Shortly after 1984 was published, 
or well explained. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. Totalitarianism is a political system whereby a centralized state apparatus attempts to control virtually all aspects of life. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state, the Italian dictator Mussolini succinctly put it. While totalitarianism can emerge under the guise of various political ideologies, in the 20th century it was communism and fascism that provided the ideological support for this type of rule. Communism and fascism are often viewed as being on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but in the manner they were put into practice in the 20th century, both of these systems displayed the characteristics of the totalized, all-controlling state. Both used force and propaganda to attain power, crush economic and civil liberties, smother culture, partake in mass surveillance, and terrorize the citizenry with psychological warfare and eventually mass imprisonment and mass murder. Speaking of Stalin's communist Russia and Hitler's Nazi Germany, Orwell explained, The two regimes, having started from opposite ends, are rapidly evolving towards the same system, a form of oligarchical collectivism. In the communist and fascist political systems of the 20th century and in 1984, the totalitarian regime maintained a tight grip of control on the populace through the use of manufactured fear. Totalitarian leaders, whether of the right or of the left, know better than anyone else how to make use of fear. They thrive on chaos and bewilderment. The strategy of fear is one of their most valuable tactics. In 1984, continuous war between the three superstates perpetuated this state of fear. It was not important who was at war with who, or who was allied with who, as this was changing all the time. And the point of the war was not for one superstate to conquer another, but for all three superstates to work behind the scenes to create the conditions of terror that would enable them all to institute totalitarian controls within their own borders. Constant surveillance of all of the citizens was an additional tool in the arsenal of the totalitarian regime of 1984. Surveillance not only allowed for more effective overt control of the citizenry, but it also induced paranoia, which made it less likely that any citizen would even dare step out of line. This surveillance was achieved, firstly, through the technology of the telescreen, which was installed in everyone's home and throughout the streets, and as Orwell explained, the telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. There was of course no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard, and, except in darkness, every movement scrutinized. Secondly, mass surveillance of the citizenry was conducted by the citizens of 1984 themselves. Each person watched everyone else, and each person was, in turn, watched by everyone else. The most innocent of expressions, an innocuous statement, or a subtle look of disapproval when Big Brother appeared on the telescreen, was reported to the thought police and treated as a thought crime or a face crime, as evidence that one was disloyal and had something to hide. It is intolerable to us that an erroneous thought should exist anywhere in the world, however secret and powerless it may be, Orwell has the character O'Brien explain. In Stalinist Russia, Alexander Solzhenitsyn noted that one could never be sure whether one's neighbors, friends, co-workers, the postman, or even in some cases one's own family, would report to the secret police a slip of the tongue, a criticism of Stalin or of communism. For if one was reported their fate was usually sealed. The police would knock at the door in the middle of the night and soon after one would be given the standard sentence of a tenor, that is, ten years in the slave labor gulag prison camps. This form of surveillance created social conditions wherein most citizens adopted hypocrisy and lying as a way of life, or as Solzhenitsyn explains in the Gulag Archipelago. The permanent lie becomes the only safe form of existence. Every wag of the tongue can be overheard by someone, 
every facial expression observed by someone. Therefore, every word, if it does not have to be a direct lie, is nonetheless obliged not to contradict the general, common lie. There exists a collection of ready-made phrases, of labels, a selection of ready-made lies. In addition to a ubiquitous state of fear, in totalitarianism there exists a widespread state of confusion and mental disorientation amongst the citizenry. Many victims of totalitarianism have told me in interviews that the most upsetting experience they faced was the feeling of loss of logic, the state of confusion into which they had been brought, the state in which nothing had any validity. They simply did not know what was what. In 1984, widespread mental disorientation was stimulated via the falsification of history and the negation of the concept of objective truth. The Ministry of Truth was the institution which falsified history. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased. The eraser was forgotten. The lie became truth. One of the reasons totalitarian regimes attempt to alter history is because it rids the society of any past reference points or standards of comparison which might remind the citizens that life in the past was so much better than it is in the sterile and oppressive present. Within 20 years at the most, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable, wrote Orwell. But another reason history is falsified by totalitarians is to ensure there are no historical roots to which the citizen can anchor and find a truth, sustenance and strength. In totalitarianism, there can be no historical information which contradicts or puts into question the reigning political ideology, nor any institution, such as religion, which offers the individual a refuge from the influence of the state. And so as Orwell wrote in 1984, Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street and building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And that process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Does that sound familiar? It does. It does to me. So, again, Academy of Ideas. I hope you subscribe because it just a fabulous channel. Uh, very thoughtful videos and really if you're somebody serious about doing that work on yourself if you're you know somebody who likes to think critically and beyond your own kind of habitual thinking you might want to check out a whole lot of his videos. Why an obsession with safety creates sick minds and a sick society. And do we live in a brave new world? Okay, um, I'll end with this just a few minutes of after school Alan Watts, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. 
We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You had better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. <laughs> and having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. See, because sometimes doing good to others, and to even doing good to oneself, is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. 